<laughs> Welcome. Good. I think people are still trickling in. We'll give a couple more seconds. Perfect. Good. Um, yes, welcome so much to the third um, Startup Story event uh, in this fall. Um, we already had two other ones at the last couple of weeks. I think many of you are reoccurring. We all joined for the Failing Forward event and then the Crowd Investing event last week. Um, so it's really nice that many of you also signed up for the event today, which is going to be about build a startup with an exit strategy. Um, we have three uh, really cool founders here with us today that were so kind to agree on sharing a little bit about um, what their story was like. And I'm very curious to, to hear that. Um, first, I want to quickly introduce um, the organizing team. So that's Vanessa Mooring, who is also here on the call. Uh, she's the startup uh, campus uh, marketing and community builder. And my name is Linda Erne, and I am the project manager at the Impact Hub in Zurich. And together with the University in Liechtenstein, we are organizing this event today. Uh, hello to Liechtenstein. Unfortunately, we couldn't be there in person, but um, it's nice to connect virtually as well. So on the agenda today, um, we have one and a half hours. Uh, we will just do a quick welcome by the Startup Campus and um, Impact Hub Zurich. Then I will introduce to you our three panelists that I already mentioned, and then we'll already jump in straight to the panel discussion to learn a little bit more about um, yeah, how to build a startup with an exit strategy. At the end, we'll have about 25, 30 minutes for a Q&A. So that's when all of you guys who are attending the session today also can ask your questions. Um, if you have questions already along the way, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, also, if you want to introduce yourself or share a LinkedIn profile or something, feel free to do that. We're happy to have an active chat. Um, but we'll then open at the end um, of the Q&A session. So you can also share your face and your voice if you feel comfortable or ask your question. And then if we have time, we will ask it for you. And then all the way at the end, I will just quickly talk about some of the startup campus programs, um, which could be relevant for you in the audience that you can profit from. And then we'll finish it off at, um, at 5.30. So, um, yeah, so we will actually already jump into um, the main topic of today. As I said, we have three founders here today, which is really, really cool. Um, all of them from different sectors, so that makes it a bit more exciting. Um, we have Joel Ross, who is the managing, managing director at Nautilus. We have Wille Heimgarter, who is a Senior Innovation Project and Sustainability Manager at DPD. And then we have Max Wirtz, who is the co-founder and chairman of Fair Walter. Um, and yes, all of the three have, um, have exit, exit experience and all of them in different sectors. Um, so I would love it if all three of you could quickly introduce yourself, tell um, the audience a little bit about yourself, what you're currently working on, um, and maybe a little bit about what you have been working on in the past um, without getting too much into the details of um, your exit story yet. So we want to keep that for a bit later. Um, but maybe, Ville, can I give you the, the word to, to kick it off? Sure. Um, thank you for the invite, first of all. I'm happy to be here. So I'm currently working at DPD Switzerland, looking after the electrification of the whole fleet um, to sustainably, sustainability as well and innovation projects. Um, I used to have uh, a startup with three other founders, Imagine Cargo, and we did a flexible and sustainable delivery from the warehouse till the end consumer. And the end consumer could choose the place and um, time when the delivery is delivered. We did that in Switzerland and Germany and um, had a team of uh, in Switzerland, Germany and the Ukraine with our um, own developer as well. That's in a, in a nutshell. 
Good. Thank you. Max, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So after like um, about 10 years in investment banking and consulting, uh, we started Fairwater about uh, five years ago. Um, it's a thus a uh, company that um, has uh, landlords and property managers um, rent out their properties. Um, so that per se is not innovative. The play was very simply uh, moving some business model that was uh, on-premise um, into the cloud. A little like Salesforce, but uh, a couple of notches smaller. And um, we uh, sold to the um, market leader uh, beginning of this year. Congratulations. And Joel, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm also super excited to be here. I think Startup Campus is a great initiative for entrepreneurship at universities. I think we can even push it further to, towards high schools, maybe in the future. I think it's highly underrepresented in these stages of life. So unless... Uh, Max, I started my startup. We, we did it probably at roughly the same time, so five years ago, but myself without any work experience apart from some internships. Uh, so fresh out of university where I had a background in mechanical engineering, then did a master's in robotics. And today I'm leading uh, software teams. So uh, uh, the path in life is not always fully straight. Um, yeah, my company Way was acquired by Nautilus, and here I lead uh, the global digital product management for a 45-year-old hardware company, which brings interesting challenges uh, it, it, in itself. So happy to tell you more. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's um it's really interesting uh, because all of you have such different experiences. And also, I think it's a, almost a bit of a mysterium sometimes. People don't really know. You always hear this person had an accident, this startup had an exit. But then, yeah, it's um yeah, you don't really know what's actually behind, how the process works. Um, is it something to strive for? Who does it work for? Who does it not work for? Um, so I'm hoping we can shed a little bit of light um, to these questions here today. Um, first, I would love to hear a little bit about uh, your individual specific exit strategy that you pursued uh, with your startup, um, whether it was an acquisition, IPO, merger, or another approach. And what were the primary factors and considerations that influenced the decision to actually go down this path? Maybe we can, yeah, does anyone want to just jump ahead? I I dislike the word uh, exit strategy uh, mm -hmm. because just what I mentioned before, it uh, usually turns out very differently than you're planning also with exits. Uh, so especially for first time founders as we were, I believed back in the days and still believe like starting a business with a clear exit strategy in mind is the wrong place to start. So uh, it's also some of the most renowned investors worldwide tell other early stage investors, don't ask for uh, exit strategies in pre-seed and seed rounds, but they still always do. So uh, you need to come up with something that they like. Otherwise, you'll end up like us having trouble to fundraise in the pre-seed and seeds uh, because we usually told them we're here to build a fantastic team that builds a great product and build a sustainable business and exit strategy, uh, exit options will come along the way. Um, and uh, in the end, we were, we were proven right. I'm not saying this is like the only path to an exit, but I think um, don't, don't start your business already under the premise of selling it in a specific way. <laughs> mm, I, I think I, I can agree. As my first, you know, I, I came from a corporate world. I worked for the big state-owned company, Swiss Post and Swiss Railway. And, you know, my pitch to investors was always, you know, I want to early retire at 35 um, and your money is safe. In the end, I think, you know, for a logistics company as well, you need a lot of capital uh, to actually make it. Uh, and the only really... Okay. 
if you really want to go the exit strategy, then you know you need to build it very big and uh, sell or have that unique thing that the company really needs without them actually building it themselves cheaper. Um, I think, and then, you know, actually selling to a big company has then, you know, your little baby, which is then just kind of crap by that company. I'm not sure if that's in hindsight always the best thing um, exactly. And for us, it was, uh, was as well, you know, we always, talk to the big logistics companies we always were there but it's yeah it was nice with them but it's not something in the end i really um yeah looking at hindsight we sh as we should have done but not for acquisition i think but uh i think logistics is anyways you know i mean for me i think you oh, sorry no no just one last thing i think for for us it was you know Logistics as well is a low margin game, so you nobody else really wants to buy a logistics company. That's probably something as well. And yet you found someone. Um, I think it's important to think about which uh, stage at which stage you want to think about the exit strategy. And um, clearly, um, you shouldn't like uh, do it at the very first thing before you come up with an idea, right? Um, but and. And maybe not, not not pursue something you like because you don't immediately see the exit. But I think um, truly we haven't thought about an exit strategy when coming up with the idea. And now I'm there looking for uh, for new startup ideas, and I cannot help but absolutely evaluate if there's a good exit strategy in the end. Because um, I think if you only talk to people um, who succeeded in some way, and there may have been a lucky a luck factor in there. Uh, then they all will tell you based on their own experience that you shouldn't worry about it. And you know, Steve Jobs uh, connect the dots backwards. It's all going to work out nicely. <laughs> but I happen to know a lot of guys who built maybe slightly more impressive startups than we have and who really struggle to monetize it, right? Because they built something that is kind of um, not a bad startup, but um, maybe too small to hire a new uh, managing director and they want to get out. And it's really difficult, right? So um, if you just think about how many people ultimately um, build a company large enough to have an IPO. Maybe ON is a good example in Switzerland. A few more, um, like planted maybe on the way. Um, but literally everyone else who kind of made it as an entrepreneur had an exit, right? Um, of some sorts. So I think that's literally um, the 99% way of getting paid. So um, I think it's super important. And um, maybe you shouldn't really do it at the very first thing. But when you when you look at different ideas in the beginning, have it in the back of your head, right? And then that's sort of the middle uh, stage, I think, where um, we were super active. Um, like we didn't think about exits in the early stage. Um, today, for a new startup, I would. The middle stage, I think it's really important to just put yourself out there, like think who might be a buyer, who might be a corporation partner, and just network a lot, right? Because um, you're not getting too distracted that way, but you're putting yourself out there and you're kind of actively helping um, the, the chance to already know the people, right? And be in touch with them. I think that's important. If from the very first moment, and there I agree with Joel, if you from the very first moment only build the startup so you can sell it in five years, then maybe you don't like the idea enough and maybe you don't uh, focus enough on building something awesome. But um, I just, from my experience, uh, know enough people who should have probably thought more about Nexus strategy and who um, now sort of um, have to carry on and don't really want to carry on and uh, have no clear path forward. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a really good point. When should you oh. yeah, when should you start looking at it or when should you yeah, should you from the beginning pre-seed seed already have a, a strategy in mind um or not? Maybe yeah, we can dive into that a little bit deeper because maybe some people are currently at the stage or I know actually for a fact that many people in this call right now are in the in the moment of maybe building a company, think having an idea. Um, how much should they focus on maybe selling it, um, the financial part, and how much should they really just focus on loving the product and loving the problem? Um, do you have any any more kind of tips um, how you how you went about that? I guess so. So I mean, I, I can somewhat um, agree to what what Max was saying. You need to understand what kind of company you're building, right? But I think your attractiveness for 
an acquisition and having success with your business model usually should go roughly hand in hand. So, uh, I mean, from experience, I can only talk now about uh, high touch B2B software as a service, right? So we were working super closely with our partners. We were a very good partner to them, went uh, above and beyond to like satisfy their requirements and the projects we had together. And that finally led to a high interest by actual multiple of our partners to incorporate us into their business. Now, it's, it's completely different if you build a direct-to-consumer or, a, or a, a consumer app, for example, then it's all about your uh, user numbers and potentially your revenue that would make you an attractive uh, acquisition target. So, I believe very often they do go hand in hand and that allows you also to really focus, not like go opposite direction. Do we want to go for an exit or a successful business, but try to align the two. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of creativity involved, right? You can uh, still sort of uh, turn your focus a little bit and find um, find good opportunities even if you haven't had that in mind early on, right? So it's not like you didn't think about it in the first month and then all is lost for sure not. Absolutely agreed. Yeah, I I agree as well. I think in the end as well, from in a logistics perspective, you know, you're transporting something um, and it's something that, you know, if you start a logistics company, you anyways need to get in touch with all the big players around because you need, you need to get volumes and integrate and all the things. And I think it's all about relationship management, especially in logistics. You know, um, we as a tech company at the time um, were also just because of the people we had in the startup very attractive because, you know, um, just as an example, TPD Switzerland has around 190 systems. Uh, some of them are 30 or more years old. So um, just having something that's a bit new and a different approach and the people that really commit to it as well is very valuable to certain companies as well. But that means as well that the companies need to know you and part of your team as well because uh, nobody buy something that they wouldn't know exactly how to and for me as well you know it's like i always uh, compare it to uh, my wife um i wouldn't have married her if i wouldn't have known her for a while and i think that's the same with having companies potentially buying your company or acquiring it mm -hmm. absolutely You got to put yourself out there and sort of passively, um, passively uh, create the chance for this to happen, right? By uh, talking to partners and uh, and um, just playing kind of a long game without uh, wanting it too badly and without losing focus, I guess. Yeah. Totally agree, yeah. And uh, what I also see is, you know, sometimes what you said, like the, the long game, you don't have even to talk about uh, acquisition or anything you can have uh, about the uh, strategic partnership and the project they kind of I indirectly fund or anything that you can connect to the companies mm -hmm. helps I think. Mm -hmm. 100% you almost never talk about uh, acquisitions uh, more about partnering right but those are likely the guys who uh will be strategic, like the, the guys who are logical partners for you often end up being the potential buyers too. Makes total sense. Can you all um, explain a little bit the whole process of selling a company? How does it actually work? Uh, what are some of the initial discussions and considerations that you might have? And then all the way until the final negotiations of closing a deal. Um, can you kind of lay out the process a little bit for us? I can start as well. I think for us, uh, probably the most unconventional way. Um, since for us, it was, you know, we had a, a big funding round. We had a lot of different investors uh, on board. And, um, you know, we had uh, well, we had the Migros of Switzerland as an indirect investor. We had Oxford Springer, Porsche um, 
And we had everything lined up with a lead investor of uh, German Mittelstand, the logistics uh, provider for Volkswagen, as their first big investment, you know, and kind of as in logistics, as I said before, you know, the, you need a lot of money. So we had um, long lead times as well for our investment rounds. And um, somehow that lead investor, we had everything set up, um, actually backed out nearly uh, oh, just a couple of days before signing the round. And that left us in a very difficult spot because we had already run out of a lot of money. So we, for us founders, we didn't pay out money for about six months before. And then we kind of had, okay, we're, we had different um, companies as well, you know, a German, a Swiss, and then a Ukrainian one. And um, we got money as well from an investor on the deal that we have that big round. And, you know, as a startup, you run anyways on um, on the cash you have. So we already spent part of it as well. Hindsight, probably not the best thing. Um, so we actually got in a situation where he said we should, if it, the round doesn't come together, we need to pay back the money, part of it, which was already spent. So we were in a position to see how we can actually save the company. And there were two options get that round together again or sell the company or the technology in the end. And um, we kind of had through that history of those three, four years we operated, um, had different leads with different companies as well. And, you know, then we actually contacted the main heads or the main company uh, people and said, you know, we're in that situation. Um, we're looking for funding or if you're willing to buy the technology. Uh, and I think it was then in the end, the process of about nine months till we sold it, the company to DPD Switzerland. But as I said, they were really interested in the technology, but one of the USPs was really the people behind it because they wanted to have the team and the, the technology in the end. And, you know, we had, different talks with another big Swiss um, stakeholder group, which has about 50 stakeholders involved in that company and just getting the, the right people for the due diligence and everything that was a, a big mess. And we even would have had the option to sell the technology twice, um, but that yeah, didn't come through in the end. So I think for us, it was, you know, and also coming back to the, what was said before, you know, in the years after, there were companies who I think probably had better USPs who went bankrupt because just the timing of the whole situation for us was better. Yeah. And uh, one last thing, it was like two weeks before the lockdown in Switzerland, we actually signed the deal with TPD. Two weeks later, they wouldn't have signed it anymore because, well, Pandemic cash is king. Um, yeah, that's uh, my story in that sense. Just out of curiosity, did you um, sort of focus on uh, one buyer uh, fully, or did you manage to sort of, um, even though it's a lot of work, uh, were you trying to get different uh, buyers competing? Definitely, we even had as we had the whole deal structured that way that we could have mm -hmm. sold in different industries in different countries the the technology. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think in the end the problem was you couldn't really sell the people twice, and as well the mm -hmm. uh, also the assets of the the developing team in the Ukraine now fully uh, emerged in the DPD world, so it. I think the assets behind as well, that's the problem. Only software is mm -hmm. nice, but it's the people mm -hmm. together, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately. Sure. But, I'm... but you were not sort of, uh, you, weren't, uh, you weren't in a situation where you could be blackmailed, right? You had a sort of uh, com competitors and uh, kind of uh, yeah. were safe on that end, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And we got some money out of it in the end as well, but I didn't retire, unfortunately, still working. But, you know, in the end, I probably would have been as well uh, a <laughs> bit, um, how to say, boring without any work. So, Yeah, it's, an, it's a really, by the way, interesting point. I'm not sure it's in the scope. Um, 
uh, of this meeting, but it's uh, it's really interesting how you structure that if you have to carry on working right with Texas. Um, but uh, I can quickly walk you through uh, um, how throughout the process worked. Um, even though uh, putting ourselves out and uh, we're in touch with potential buyers, um, we never actually asked anyone to buy us, but we got a two occasions um, a request to be bought. Um, the first time by a big player, uh, big, big real estate owner, um, the deal was going well. And then last second, uh, Corona started, lockdown started. Um, the mother company who wanted to buy us um, had to mm -hmm. back out. They didn't have the money anymore. So um, we were pretty screwed. We didn't, uh, we were so sure this is working out. We didn't really take care of financing enough. Like we started uh, raising a round, but we didn't finish it. And uh, then um, it turned out very lucky in hindsight um, that the say users of a property management software are usually owners of many houses and have a lot of money. So uh, actually from our customers, we could raise a pretty big, uh, like a convertible uh, round was the sort of, uh, safe scheme that you find in Silicon Valley. Um, but so that was the first failed um, exit. And a couple of years later, we were approached by our final buyer, VNV, who um, are the market leader who were interested in the product and the sort of SaaS stack to, to um, sort of um, bring their dominant market position um, in, in on-premise uh, property management software to, uh, to a SaaS solution. And um, the process was really so in that sense that um, we were approached by them. Um, we uh, got some support from them on the um, funding side. So agreed not to do a financing round. So um, that in this stage precluded us from um, building up a big a big list of competing companies. Um, like couldn't really, really run a, a sale process where different companies compete. And um, what I thought was most interesting about this process is um, the, the way you structure the deal and the way you build a data room and get those things together, right? It's uh, between the, the moment where you basically agree on the deal, which can happen in a couple of weeks and then it's slowed down by a few board meetings to the moment where this actually happens. Um, it's, a, it's a process that for us took uh, almost half a year and I blame it entirely on lawyers on both sides, right? It's just... Um, it's just um, the founders and the 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 owner and the, the board of the buyer can agree very quickly, and then um, you have your data room together. Um, you work day and night to make this happen, and then just the the regular sort of um, game starts where uh, tax tax advisors and lawyers come and find problems, and the uh, ESOP structure of your company is not, uh, has some open issues the tax lawyer doesn't understand, and um, and usually the tax lawyer on the buyer side may not be really good at startup stuff, so. Um, that was just surprising how long this took and how much uh, resources on both sides went into this. And Absolutely. I have no advice how to do this better next time. I think that's just how it sort of happens. I actually ex excluded myself at some point from the lawyers' meetings because I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> Guys, this is this is too much. Uh, I need to leave now. Um, I. I think our process was a bit similar to what you what you described. So um, again, we were working very closely with some larger partners, and I think partnerships were all going pretty well. But that didn't kickstart for us the process to even think about acquisition because things were really going well. And I mean, it was still early in the startup journey, so we did not lose thought over being acquired. Then. A competitor of the partners we already had approached us and we did our usual business development call and they came back to us and said we're very interested but not in a partnership but in an acquisition we're like oh wow, wow okay this is a surprise but um why not well, why not explore mm -hmm. it and um yeah, a much larger partner always will find ways to make it very attractive and sound very good and everything is going to work out well. But uh, in the end, it's always about the people too. And every part or every acquisition or most acquisitions, I have to say, um, are interested in bringing the people along, um, at least some of them. And therefore, for us, it was also important that our our team members felt very positive about this potential acquisition. So in the end, we did not go with that that company, but I think it made some 
uh, Waves or uh, our other partners figured something was uh, going on. So we were yeah, we were mm-hmm. kind of transparent and told them. And uh, in the end, it was really they were they came back very strongly and said, we love working with you guys uh, before you sign anything. Let us at least do a counter. That was, of course, a very comfortable position where mm-hmm. we managed to fix some important terms up front before even going into some kind of exclusivity. So basically in the in the letter of interest that uh, would then bring you in the whole due diligence we were able to fix already some terms and that allowed us to structure this process in a bit more quickly the original agreement was it would take two and a half months of course it took longer than that because of yes uh, lawyers and uh, going back and forth and back and forth and um, it's what, what Max also said it's very scary so during that time we needed uh, during that due diligence we were like okay are they really going through with this because we're not raising the money we could right now mm-hmm. we're stopping business development mm-hmm. we're not a lot of the product development because our people are in technical interviews and in some future product discussions and uh, whole integration plans and so on and uh yeah, most of all, it it would have been a huge like um, bump in our business because yeah, we we worked with different mm-hmm. companies of the same market, and our potential acquire at this point required us to like cut those contracts. Not that they would in the end uh, be fiddled uh, mm-hmm. up in a contract with one of their competitors. So it was extremely scary. And we were very lucky that we were able to fix some terms up front that would at least, uh, for example, give us some money back for this time of the due diligence and gave us good kind of a good security. But also we did from four offers that we had, we did go with a partner we were working with the longest who really made a very solid plan of how we would integrate how this whole partnership or new company would look like and how we would work together and we felt very very good on a personal level which was important for us as founders during that that scary time as well as for our team Mm -hmm. you all for it's really sorry yeah go for it max sorry i was just wanted to uh please emphasize the point yo joel made um, about uh sort of the financing round right the cost of uh of uh doing this uh, due diligence process is huge in the sense that uh you cannot um well first of all your day only has 24 hours right and it's usually um the ceo who's doing both the fundraising and the uh, negotiations about the exit but also even if you manage to fit in that time going out with the exact same excitement and uh, pitching to your uh, investors and new investors um something that you believe 95% is not going to happen, that is really uh, twisted, right? You um, you inevitably will sort of, um, in my experience, I experienced it twice in the process. It's very difficult to, um, as a plan B, raise a serious fin- financing round. You can even wonder if it's fair towards the investors, right? Because they also spend uh, on their side um, time and resources on the due diligence, which you truly believe is not going to happen. But so... Um, mm. That is one of the more complicated sort of costs of involved in engaging in this. And uh, the other one I really like to, um, you don't usually go out and ask people for an acquisition to be bought, right? Because if you do, it's also weak signaling. You look like there's something hidden. Um, but if you tell them transparently that um, someone made an offer, then suddenly it's, it's a complete opposite picture. They don't reckon that or figure that something's wrong with you and you're in trouble. But the contrary, they think, oh, wow, someone else um, is acting. We have to be quick now. So um, it's, it was the case for us. Other people in the end wanted to um, join bidding. And um, I've heard this not only from you, but from many that uh, sort of um, one unsolicited offer can, uh, can become or turn into a situation where a couple of companies compete. Yeah, we, we uh, tried- just, just fully agree with the process. And, uh... we, we had tried not to stop our fundraising. We were also very transparent with the investors who were interested before. And we said, okay, look, uh, this might work. We feel good about it. But if not, we, we do have a plan B and we would like to continue that partnership we discussed originally. If it had happened, nobody knows because, again, business took a big bump 
during that time uh, but we we tried our very best to keep some kind of exit from the exit open mm -hmm. mm. yeah it also sounds like uh, if it just comes across without you looking for it that it's a big surprise and you might not be prepared for it at all um and it sounds super overwhelming to be honest like how do you how do you structure such a deal if you have never done it before how do all the legal aspects works and then you also have to have some kind of trust um in just believing that yeah everyone has a uh yeah you want to believe that it's that everyone has good intentions but you never really know um do you have any any tips on that on how to how do you yeah when it first comes up those questions about actually yeah selling your company or not um sounds extremely overwhelming yeah how do you deal with it in the first place so very very little is built on trust in such a process uh what, what max said about the lawyers uh everything you you make contracts for the bad times right so as long as everything's good nobody looks at what exactly is stated in the contract but at some point along the way something might be uncovered that was not known originally and you want to have that in writing and the the only trust you really need to have is in your lawyer uh, because you don't want to die. You couldn't dive deep enough into those things. We had a lawyer who structured roughly 50 such acquisitions before uh, and who, again, we felt really comfortable with on a personal level. And we trusted this guy to really like help us structure this deal in a way where we would not... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, mess it up and that's really that's a lot of money you're spending on a lawyer um, but uh, uh, don't, don't even try to structure this yourself yeah i fully agree i mean in the end of the day you kind of build your connection to the lawyer as well through the funding rounds beforehand so you kind of have a trusted partner and for us as well mm -hmm. we had an advisory board of um, serial entrepreneurs or the on, other entrepreneurs also gone through the process so they actually could help us as well pinpoint the things you really need to look at and um, that helps as well but because in the end i mean you stand in front of the lawyers they read i mean probably you guys know they read through every sentence and uh, tell, and then you think hmm, what does that sentence actually explicitly say or what is it uh, to me or the company itself and i think that's only something really a lawyer can help and you know the first bill you get from a lawyer mm -hmm. the first funding round that kind of uh you go straight out of the door again but uh that's well invested money in the end um because without them you know mm -hmm. you probably sell your soul with the clause that says well mm -hmm. if something goes wrong they get it for zero cents so Absolutely. I mean, um, some point, uh, Willie, you were emphasizing is the uh, role of the board. Um, I think the board was uh, even more important than the lawyers in the sense that uh, the investors of the board have kind of been in your shoes um, often enough. Maybe initially to do a big exit and then as uh, board members of investors on other startups. So um, if you guys have to go around running and, uh, and do a good job, um, you don't need the board. I think we needed the board a lot for other things too, but um, even if you're amazing entrepreneurs and you never need the board, this is the first time you really need the board. Um, they make an intro to the right um, lawyers, maybe maybe closing a funding round, closing a CLA, so you can do with templates. I mean, I I don't think we needed uh, lawyers very much in the process. I had some uh, corporate finance uh, banking background and um, SigTech has amazing uh, templates. Like um, the first time you really need the lawyers then. And um, the other thing the board can provide you is a sort of experience and how to structure the negotiation process, right? That is something that the lawyer kind of, um, the lawyers make sure everything's correct and you're not making mistakes, but they don't exactly, in my experience, help you with doing things right. They, the structuring of the negotiation process, um, how you negotiate, how you get the best offer, how you sort of, um, where you can be pushy, where you risk losing the deal. Um, that is something usually... Um, a really, really uh, experienced investor on the board can do way more for you. So um, that reminds it. Like, um, if you if you manage to build a board, um, 
it ideally someone who uh, who's invested, right? Pick someone who who uh, is great at uh, financing and uh, exit things. Most important part. Mm. He will he will also bring the buyer if you haven't got one already. So that 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 one or two guys on the board, um, this is the first time they can shine, and maybe you don't need them before, but uh, it's all worth it if you if you sort of uh, strategically build your board beforehand. Yeah, I can totally agree to that. Uh, I was uh, really talking about the structure and the contract negotiations, but we did had a lot of support really from uh, our investors as well who have gone through acquisitions with other companies and were able to really support the negotiations and put like the finger on where we need to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can also quickly talk about, um, it seems like it's really important to have a good advisory board, a good support system. How do you build that? What Do you have any tips on how to to surround yourself with a really good advisory board, with really yeah good people that can support you? Because there are, Ville, you said you had a few serial entrepreneurs on your board. They don't, just don't walk around and you can grab them. I guess you need some some kind of uh, approach on how you can actually build a support system that, that's good for you. What, do you have any tips for people that are in this phase right now of building an advisory board? Uh, I think in the end, it's really about, well, the network you have, and it's really talking <laughs> to different people. Uh, and, you know, it's especially the early stage investors or the board members, you kind of, uh, my experience uh, is that you have to have a personal connection to a certain extent, because you probably spend a lot of time with them as well. So if you don't get along with them, then the best advice wouldn't help. Um, so in that sense, it's, you know, if you have, a, I mean, we worked as well the first time in the Impact Hub. Through the Impact Hub, we got a lot of uh, connections through other networks. And then it's, you know, people know people. I mean, in the end of the day, it's really networking. I think uh, there's, also, I don't have a, that one thing that helped us find the right people. Mm -hmm. Were you looking, uh, sorry, Ms. Leiden, if I um, interrupt there, Villa, did you um, look for board members like this or did you just primarily look for investors and they became your board members? Uh, we have, we had both. We also had people who weren't investors, but helped us on the way as well. Um, mm -hmm. And because it's always different, as a, well, in logistics, there's, uh, it's a, niche market as a niche market in the startup space in that sense so you have to have people who really mm -hmm. know the nitty-gritty part as well from that part but then also the entrepreneurial part um so we kind of had both as well and people who advised us on different things mm -hmm. so we didn't have that classical board with only investors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did you get the um, board members incentivized to really like sort of put in the time and uh, and help you guys? Like, this is uh, they're more motivated if um, their money is in the company, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we had. I mean, they they helped us as well on the funding, so they get a certain kickback on that as well for the, mm -hmm. if they uh, got the right investors on board. And otherwise, it was really. You know, sometimes I think it's the, they didn't spend hours on it. It was a half an hour there on a coffee yeah. and um, you probably couldn't rely on them like yeah. on a daily basis, but on strategic things, they would pretty much help out. Yeah, I'm not sure how you guys set up the board or how you came to the board members in the end. Yeah, I wanted I wanted actually to ask the same as Max. So. Uh... I, we only had investors on the board and I think this is very na natural and really keeps the incentive straight. So uh, usually also the people you want in your board in any industry are proven industry experts, right? And those are usually people who tend to have already made some money that they could invest. So if somebody is only coming to you as a board member or showing interest in joining your board without putting down money, I'd be at the very least cautious. So for us, uh, we were looking for people joining us as investors and there, there's two kinds you want, right? The ones that 
are inactive investors and they just bring the money and uh, you don't care about the expertise. Then there's the one with the expertise and you want them as active as possible. The other okay. two things you don't want, like somebody with great experience, but I'm just putting in some money and will not help anymore. Or the ones with very little expertise, but want to stay active. Those will be a big disturbance all along the way. But we're really looking for the ones that mm -hmm. can help you is usually worth more than the money that they put in. Still try to get them to put some money in uh, because, yeah, uh, aligned incentives is always great to mm -hmm. make sure there's a, a common goal. I mean, I, I totally agree. And maybe two, two small uh, sort of uh, tangents are uh, cases where that doesn't align perfectly. Uh, maybe at early rounds, uh, you and your founder or your co-founders, you, in our case, we had two seats because we're two guys um, and we were entitled to three and a half seats and the investors to one and a half seats, right? So um, we gave founder seats to investors. There, of course, we took guys who were extremely founder friendly and had our back, right? Because, um, Normally, the, the board representation should sort of um, represent or reflect the cap table. And um, at an early round, um, you you cannot take too or you want to take a lot of board members on, um, but still you want to uh, want the board uh, voting uh, sort of still reflect your majority, right? Mm, that's one thing to have in mind. Um, and we never had the luxury of actually sort of being super selective with who's allowed to invest. We kind of um, uh, let anyone invest who was in trouble. And from within those, um, what we try to get is um, someone who's uh, very and very much into the um, property management real estate industry, sort of the main expert. Um, one player who was really good at SaaS, had built other SaaS companies, and uh, one guy who's just a very experienced investor and knew all this uh, M and A private equity um, legal stuff, world, right? Right. Um, that was kind of uh, the deal um, composition we had on the board, but. That was a second thought after getting investors. So from the pool of investors, we chose them. Um, or in fact, they offered to be on the board, right? Um, that's just sort of, I mean, it's just difficult, right? And from my experience, um, to get someone who's really in and asking questions and spending time um, is much easier if they're already invested. Um, if if you're a super hot startup and you can pick selectively, then uh, fantastic, yeah. That's even better to get the guys who are... Um, who have the money and the experience both in one person. Thank you for sharing. Um, I would be curious to see, because now we kind of looked at what the whole process looks like. What does a deal even look like? Um, what are some things to consider? Um, but what does the afterlife of an exit look like for each of you? Uh, I can probably just start it was a, a very very interesting phase because you know it was two weeks before corona i had one meeting with uh, um, the or kind of it they, there's an, an a riga office in and i went there for a week and after that i went for one and a half years into the home office didn't see anybody face to face mm -hmm. and um, you know the problem was as well you know before we had the clear path, what you do with the software, everything. Um, we were committed as well, uh, committed ourselves for one and a half years to work with them and see afterwards how everything goes. And um, from there on, you know, for me, that probably that's uh, different than a lot of others. The project itself, we did one pilot other things got so much attention, bigger volumes, Corona, security, everything that our whole mm -hmm. project kind of, kind of got stuck on the sidelines for a long time, mm -hmm. which is then, that's what I think kind of referred to at the beginning. It's kind of pick and choose what you really want, because if then your project kind of gets stuck in the cupboard for a while, that's not an easy thing. And the first lesson I really needed to learn, and somebody as well, uh, one of the uh, advisors we had said, you know, the first thing you need to know now is it's not your company anymore. And because you can't <laughs> decide anymore how to do it. And if you try to work the same way, you just mm -hmm. destruct yourself. And um, I think that was the first yeah, learning. And it took a while. Yeah. 
But I think there's other experience which go better than our my experience in that sense. No, I completely agree. And I think um, the buyer was usually afraid that after selling, you don't care anymore and you just go away. Um, whereas in reality, it's maybe the other way around. But, um, for me, it was great to be sort of um, to get rid of the day-to-day uh, -to -day, um, operational stress, but still be involved in the strategic parts. And um, of course, you still want the, the, the thing you've done for the last five or more years to succeed, right? And um, it's it's, uh, it's a challenge to um, to accept that maybe things are not uh, done in exactly the way you think is perfect, right? Uh, it's that's definitely one of the things you have to do initially. And um, and what's also interesting is how, um, in my op opinion, mm, even if nothing much changes, right? If the leadership is the same, how the um, pure fact that there's a different owner now presumably without the a sort of stress of being a startup how that um, changes dynamics in the team as well right like your your ears up your team was motivated not uh was, was a tiny salary and the big ears up suddenly uh, that's breaking away right so suddenly um salaries are renegotiated the ears up is paid out um it's a different company instantly and you you don't exactly know why right it's the same office the same people the same management but it's very different that was really uh sort of impressive hmm. Yeah, um, very similar experience. So <clears throat> when you do before 12 different things uh, day by day, um, all of a sudden you get asked, like, what do you want to do? And uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you can really choose the, the thing you're most passionate about and get a little bit less noise around that. So luckily for me and the higher level, I'd say nothing much has changed. So uh live a very similar life to before, uh, still work too much, uh, still work with the same people mostly. Um, the only thing really is probably the work content. So we did we didn't, did bring our product to market. So that was great with us. It didn't land in a, in a cupboard or anything. It just took way longer. And that was then like the first lessons learned um, of uh, in the big corporate world. So um, I'm still learning. I'm learning very different things, uh, but it's uh, uh, the, the exciting journey for me at least continues. And um, I, I'm looking forward to what else, what else we can do with uh, within this new setup. And maybe as a last question before we then open it to the to the um, participants, which I see actually that there are already some questions. So thank you for that. Um, in hindsight, would there be any say anything that you would um, choose to make differently? Or maybe also if you if you have another company coming up and you're um, thinking about selling it again, is there anything that you would change that you um, did a yeah, that you felt like you did a mistake in the in the first round, or also just a general advice um, to anyone um, of your biggest learning. Yeah, luckily for for uh, the the exit part, we had the support we needed to not uh, make too many mistakes. So uh, from from our expert advisors uh before that uh, oh so many mistakes but i don't think we need to go to the 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 common startup route of trial and error and then figuring out you could have probably gotten to that point a lot faster if you knew all the things up front um nonetheless from the whole journey i definitely do it differently but i'd do it again and on the at least on the exit part for, uh, for us there's there's no uh looking back and thinking we should have done a lot differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, it's, uh, you know, it's really the question if you want to aspire to sell it, the company in the end. Um, I think it's also for me now, or what we build now currently at Top Up uh, Sauna, it's probably something we try to scale and just run as a mid-sized company, or even if it scales bigger, then fair enough. But you know, have earlier kind of the break even and just run a good company with good values and the employees that like to work for it. And 
it's not also that's my take of kind of not all, it's not always aspiring to sell the company in certain industries in logistics i think it was the right move in the end mm -hmm. because if i see what i do now the problems just were 100 times bigger uh in a normal company so they would have been the same um but yeah i think it really depends what you want to have to happen to your baby in the end mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at people um, starting their own business of any sort, um, if you if you start some sort of consulting company or some marketing agency, right? You're also an uh, entrepreneur, and um, there's no point talking about an exit. You can just uh, you're building yourself a fantastic uh, job for yourself, and and um, the thing is not scalable without you, and you're making good salary in the meantime. It's all good, right? Um, I think when you discuss about startups, it's really something that has a deep hockey stick where some external party has to finance it and so on and um and then in this situation i think the only way of getting paid is really to um if you're not the half a percent who can do an ipo or something then you need to have some exit strategy mm. and uh as i think joel said in the beginning um even though it seems like the most important thing to do to actually get paid for your effort um it anyways usually doesn't turn out the way you think right so um it's maybe a little schizophrenic that um Thinking too much about the payoff and how you're going to sell it in the beginning will just get you distracted from building something awesome. But um, still, I think uh, all the good startup journeys I've seen uh, from friends are always that someone acquired them. So um, with that in mind, as a second time founder, it's very difficult for me not to think ex ante about how to sell and how to get out of this. Um, I'm fully agreeing, by the way, with what, Joel, with, with what um, you guys said. Um, so many mistakes, not with the selling process that went um, went okay. Um, so many mistakes on the way that you can learn from. And um, of course, I would like to do it again. Um, I think the, the proverb that uh, first time founders are sort of in love with the product and second time founders are uh, in love with go to market and uh, the way how you sell it. That's definitely true, right? Because um, ultimately, um, Building a product didn't turn out to be so impossible, but um, finding a good uh, strategy, how to sell it, how to how to get people to buy it, that turned out to be the bigger problem. So um, the whole thinking is totally the other way around. I'm thinking more about exit, a little bit maybe, but I'm mostly thinking way more about how to sell it than about what to build. Mm -hmm. That is maybe the biggest sort of change between the first and second time. I agree. After the first one, you kind of, also if you really like the process, you kind of want to be your own boss again and want to be in that uh, driver's mm -hmm. seat. And I think that's the the most difficult part if you're then sold and kind of not in the driver position anymore. Uh, yeah, I think that's the really what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you so much for yeah for giving your advice. Um, I'd love to open it up now for for the audience as well. Um, for anyone who wants to ask a question, um, feel free to just uh, yeah uh, unmute yourself if you want. You can also um, show your face. Um, but yeah, or if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to post a question in the chat as well. Um, yeah, maybe I can start. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your insights and, and uh, experiences. And I want to ask, um, I think most of you are co-founders, right? And I want to ask if your team members also were um, into the idea of selling a company and if not, how did you manage the situation? Oh, yeah. luckily, yes. <laughs> I couldn't like uh, <laughs> imagine founders going against each other or the success of having an uh, opportunity for a for an exit so i think that would put the whole situation in a, in a terrible light so no we were very much aligned uh, of course we didn't we all had a lot of questions um our team had a lot of questions luckily we built a very transparent and direct culture so everybody was voicing their concerns and we needed to address them but uh, in generally the whole team uh, was pulling in the same direction. Wow. So for you guys, um, the entire team, everyone knew you were in negotiations? Yes. 
Wow, that's amazing. It was quite different for us. Um, so obviously, my co-founder and I were super aligned and uh, and uh, agreed on everything. Um, but I was in the discussions; he was not. So um, when we started with a higher price and uh, sort of um, the initial um, initial uh, negotiation started, it was always a little uh, sort of um, difficult, or it was a bit of a challenge to um, keep expectations aligned, right? Um, because uh, the price is a little lower than you expected, and you weren't in the room, it's it's difficult. I wasn't mm -hmm. alone, of course, in the room, but with um, other uh, board members. But apart from that, uh, we were super aligned. Um, not so happy, I think, were some of the um, employees who had an ASOP and who um, who uh, maybe didn't fully understand the difficulty of raising um, raising money like a year ago, half a year ago. So they were having kind of bigger hopes and wanted to go it all alone and didn't like the idea of selling to, especially on the tech side, didn't like the idea of selling to a big company. Um, and uh, we really consciously chose to keep this sort of a, a pretty closed, a clean process where not where not everyone uh, knew about it, but only sort of the the um, the founders and uh, the CTO knew about it um, because we thought that uh, the whole situation uh, difficult to understand. The parameters would uh, sort of create a lot of uh, distraction um, and. Uh, also, we came from the process of having been in such a process two years earlier, which ultimately last second uh, were almost almost celebrating it failed, right? So, um, in that uh, in that sense, we really thought let's uh, let's um, not disappoint anyone, let's not bring hopes up to unrealistic level, and uh, let's keep everyone focused on the daily business. It's enough if uh, my co-founder and I are super super distracted, right? Um, mm -hmm. Another thing, uh, some investors. Um, probably uh, would have liked to buy themselves as well at some point or sort of uh, would have liked to uh, carry on. So um, if anything, um, some investors uh, thought this was, um, they would have liked to co-invest, right? They were I'm not entirely happy with the situation, but on the, with my co-founder, in perfect alignment on this one. And I guess if you, if the co-founders cannot agree, then it's really not, it's not going to happen, right? No chance. Mm -hmm. For us, it was also it was a bit more difficult. We were four co-founders, uh, three in Switzerland, one in Berlin. So it's also you know what you do afterwards as well, because uh, who we sell to, because where do you work then afterwards? Um, so that was it was always a discussion, but in the end we kind of all agreed. You know, we don't we didn't have any other solution, but um, the one that would fit the most would get the company as well. And that meant as well that the co-founder of Berlin worked for half a year in Switzerland as well. That was then would have been the other way around as well. Um, but we were pretty transparent with the employees uh, from the beginning as well during the whole funding rounds as well. So when we had low cash, you know, we told them, you know, their salaries and our suppliers as well. So we worked with a lot of um, bike couriers that we always paid their part, but we wouldn't take any money in the meantime. And uh, so that was, but it's also, I guess for us, it was part of the trust we had to build in the network. Otherwise it wouldn't have worked. Um, yeah, but I think in the end, it's really crucial that all uh, what the others said as well, that the part of the founders align on the goal. Thank you so much. I think there are more questions in the chat, right? Yes, there are some more questions. Yeah, yeah. one person messaged me directly asking, uh, what would be your advice when selling a bootstrapped early stage startup on your own founders initiative? Um, who are good lawyers and what other steps should you take? <laughs> many thinking things no fair enough um, it doesn't really matter if it's bootstrapped right um, except that maybe if it's bootstrapped you don't have the board in place uh, and that uh, maybe um, the valuation is so so much lower that uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, get lawyers on board um, but if that is not the case if the bootstrapped startup uh, is still uh, going for uh High one digit or two digit million uh, valuation, and then uh, still get good lawyers for sure. And um, then the, the question would be who are 
the good lawyers and how to get uh, where to find experts um, to sort of replace the, law, the, the advice you get from uh, advisors, I guess, right? Joel, you are you are muted. I don't know about lawyers if it's. I don't know about lawyers if there's really such a um, such a uh, situation where um, there's one good lawyer and the rest is shit. I think uh, the big law firms are all all know what they're doing, right? Um, we were with Keller Holtz, but I think um, Walter Wies and many others are also good. It's uh, no, no big secret, and um, uh, maybe just. I know that some big companies um, had M A companies uh, run the um, bidding process for them. Um, if if you're high enough, if you can do that. If you're smaller than that, um, reach out to um, to to guys who have uh, done the setting process before. That would be my best advice. Yeah, and and even as a bootstrap company, you hopefully have built up a network of people you trust. And even though you might not have that expertise, uh, somebody will know somebody. So go the people route, go to someone you trust, asking for somebody they trust, and then vet that person. So you'll be working very closely with the lawyer. Um, it's going to be a person personal relationship to some extent and you need to you, you need to have some trust in there yeah definitely agree in the end you know you always find, if you have a startup network around you find the right lawyer that fits you through the network good thank you um, there was another question in the chat um, general question for the three speakers and founders today would you advise any special strategy to select the investors for a startup? Also, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Max said it. You you don't always get to choose. <laughs> so uh, there's there's points where you need money and uh, you're happy for money coming from any direction. Uh, that, that was the case for us as well. Um, but generally try try to go especially in the early stages and uh, double or 10 times that if you're a first time founder go for people with the relevant expertise uh, for the stage that you're in so uh, I I really really enjoy currently working with a few early stage first time founders who can really profit from me going through that very same stage as just a few years back uh, if you're in a later stage and you're looking at maybe finding the right exit strategy or you're already looking at acquisitions, you have heard some interest, look for somebody who has gone that route. And that the, that might be mm -hmm. classical investors or that might be somebody from the network that's not usually investing. So uh, there's other ways you can you can connect with people and get them involved in your process uh there's uh, mm -hmm. lots of people so uh, luckily one of our investors as not as a founder but as a as a leader on the business development or corporate development side went through three acquisitions and that was a perfect match but Without him, probably we would have needed uh, somebody else supporting us uh, during that stage who was not originally an investor. Yeah, I, fu I fully agree. I mean, in the end, you need to see what you, the startup needs or what kind of knowledge you need. And then if you are in the privileged situation to actually choose, then try, try to choose the smart money. But otherwise, I mean... You can always try to get the knowledge and the experience uh, from other sources as well. It's then just a bit more costly, mostly. Um, as you, I mean, as I said before, you don't get to choose investors, maybe to such an extent. Um, somewhat, yes. I mean, we've definitely said no to a few investors, but um, less than fifty percent, maybe. Um, but what I would say is. Um, your investors get to choose as well. And uh, if you're a first time founder and you're not really sure who to choose, um, most of the investors are um, serial investors and um, they're good at choosing. And if they choose you, then they do this because they like something about your company, but also maybe because you usually go through different meetings with them and they like you and, uh, and maybe you had a good discussion. Maybe you're not too stubborn or bullshitting a lot, but um, sort of um, 
asking questions, um, getting valuable insights from them even before they invested, right? Um, so in that process, um, ultimately, I think to a certain extent, the right investors, the investors that are right for you will actually choose you, right? Um, so that is kind of um, kind of a helpful part. Um, of course, you can go way more into detail as to what is the right strategy later on. Like you should um, look at things like an investor um, in a second, third round, if you're doing well, write a bigger check. Um, if your existing investors don't invest, it's difficult to find new investors. So you should make sure the guys on board, at least some of them can write bigger checks, those kind of things. But I think for um, early, early stage angels, I really think this sort of um, open discussion where you are learning from the insights and have, uh, have um, open discussions is super valuable. And uh, maybe one of the more important uh, questions hidden behind this is, um, where do you go find those investors, right? Do you go for angels, for angel networks, pitching competitions? Because um, these kind of choices will set you up for uh, which kind of investors, which kind of investor pool you tap into and whom you're more likely to meet. I don't so, know about you guys, what's your experience? Would you, would you recommend going for startup competitions? Pitching competitions are is that a waste of time here? So we definitely did make the mistake of going out too early, try to raise uh, money. So going back to the learnings and things we would do differently, I would spend way more time early on building the team and the product and get some traction before running to investors uh, all around and pitch competitions and so on. Uh, you just, it, it takes fundraising is a very heavy lifting and it always takes more time than expected and it always takes more effort mm -hmm. you can't you shouldn't do this on a on a 20 percent uh, of your week all the time instead do it like take three months when you feel you're really ready and yeah try try to get, get some advice uh, that, that tells you honestly when you're ready uh, because yeah, that's it's currently something that would be dear to me if investors in the ecosystem would give a bit more transparent feedback. Because often the startup ecosystem that's one of the best and one of the worst parts about it. It's very enthusiastic, so many people will tell you that's a fantastic idea. I totally want to hear more, but actually they know you which words they <laughs> them, and uh, they just want to be kept in the loop. So, um. Find somebody who honestly tells you if you're ready and then go out quickly. And uh, from what, what Max was saying, um, uh, it reminded me of something. So probably over 50% of the investors, probably over 80% of the investors are decent investors, which makes them good investors because they bring you money and uh, money you'll always need in the early stages. Just try to avoid a bad investor. Uh, those are out there too. Uh, for that, just open up your ears a bit before taking any investment in the early stages in the ecosystem. So ask around a little bit. You'll, you'll quickly hear some feedback on uh, who you should not go with. Mm. Uh, I definitely agree. And Jan, it's uh, all about fully agree, yeah. uh, the, the people you kind of like and trust. And in the end, what, what we also did is, you know, you build up your potential investor portfolio and kind of keep them updated till you actually are at that stage where you can really say, you know, now we're in full on, uh, what Joe said, full on funding mode. And then you go from investor to investor, or if you really like to the pitch night, uh, long train rides in Germany from pitch night to pitch night. Very exciting telling the same story <laughs> and uh, networking with the same story. After a while, you don't really want to listen to yourself anymore. <laughs> um, so that's why I think it's just try to focus that time what you just uh, in a couple of months at least. Otherwise, you need to tell the story ever and ever again uh, in like three, two, three days uh, apart which is not very nice in the end. I see that there's one hand raised from Andres. Do you want to ask your question? Andres, are you here and want to ask your question? 
Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry, I had problems with the microphone. Thank you nope. for sharing your story. Very, very inspiring. I'm just curious because two of you decided to share with the employees that you were thinking about an exit strategy. Did you see a performance drop or this people distracted during that period or people were active and even volunteered to help? For, for me, it was more that I think there were, you know, it's anyways, we always told everybody as it was yeah, as well, we had a funding round and before, so we had low or sometimes short on cash. So it was always a roller coaster anyways with the uh, team members and they were, they got to know to the roller coaster as well. So I think for them and we had a very highly motivated team, I would say. So everybody was till the end very motivated to work and some even before would have worked without any pay for a while, which I wouldn't have assumed that anybody would. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions or something that Max or Joel want to add on to this question? Nothing apply to us the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we 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 try to to bring all people along, uh, like uh, keep keep the excitement high. Um, of course, uh, that's uh, that, that's the key because you're even in an acquisition, you're not you're not going into uh, normally you you don't go into a, a short period relationship, but it's more like uh, yeah. You want to stay on long term and everybody should be excited about the long term opportunities. So continue selling the vision. Make sure it aligns with the vision you had before. So it, it aligns with the vision of the people behind the original one. Thank Thanks you. for sharing. Thank you for the question, Andres. Does anyone else have a question? Good. I guess if there are no more questions, um, we can release our speakers. I will still take a few more minutes afterwards to talk about the startup campus programs that we have. Um, but yeah, at this point, I guess uh, I would love to thank the three of you so much for taking the time um, and sharing so many of your insights for being transparent and helping yeah, helping us navigate this space a little bit more. I think there are many uh, misconceptions around what is an exit? Is it something to strive for? Uh, should you think about it from the beginning or not? Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's confusing also. Yeah. As you said, when first time talking about closing a deal, how do you even start? It can be really overwhelming. Might not always be uh, this shiny, great thing, but once you have done it, it does buy you some freedom. Um, so it was really, really cool to hear the, the three of you talk about your experiences. Um, hopefully you also enjoyed uh, reminiscing a bit about it. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you so, so much for, for joining us and taking the time. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, ple pleasure to be here. I'm going to go ahead and say... Um, pleasure, thank you. To, to all the guys on this call, uh, go ahead and build that startup that you have in mind and uh, now is the very best time and uh, an exit is not the only success you can take out of a startup so I would 100% have done another one even if we hadn't successfully exited but maybe had to shut the doors and we were very very close only 12 months before we then got acquired to shut the doors because we had a financing round go south and even then we said even if we have to shut down this venture, we're going to do another one because even right, right now, directly after the studies, uh, you'll learn so, so much and you'll profit so much. And this will, uh, it's going to be a great. So if you have a great idea, if you have awesome co founders, go for it. Mm, I just uh, definitely agree. I think in the end, you know, 
a lot of people have the idea, not a lot of people execute, and the executing part, that's the fun stuff in the end. Mm -hmm. Completely agreed. I guess all three here uh, are gonna gonna do it again, are doing it again already. And um, indeed, the learning is amazing, way steeper than in most other industries. And um, I think the general mood now, of startups is a little uh, difficult, right? You hear all these uh, layoffs, but that's big companies. I think um, as a founder uh, for starting a startup, um, and I think Joel said that they wish they would have raised money later on. The same is true for. For the next years, you don't need financing, right? Um, if you if you build on the product and the product market fit, uh, it's historically a fantastic time to start a startup. Um, and really encourage you guys. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the encouragement. I'm sure the people in the call appreciate it. It's difficult to start this journey, so it's really nice to have some role models to to look up to and that can shed some light to confusing parts of it. So thank you so, so much. I release you um, and I will yeah speak to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Good. And just for the for the last couple of minutes, um, I'm happy to share a few of our programs that we have here at the start of campus. Um, in case you this talk just inspired you and you are interested in learning a bit more about entrepreneurship in general, um, we have some really cool um, programs that might help you along the way. So one of them is the module two uh, business concept course. In this course, it's a 12 week program. You learn um, anything about business modeling, fundraising, um, building your team, pitching for the first time. Um, you can join this program with an already existing startup. It can also just be an idea that you initially have, or you can also just join if you don't have an idea, but you know you want to be part of a startup. So it's really um, a match for, for anyone interested in entrepreneurship. Um, it's a, yeah, a fast 12 week camp. And at the end of it, there is also a big event where we connect you to uh, all ecosystem players that can be investors, uh, some media players, general startup support organizations. So yeah, highly recommended. Um, you can feel free to, to scan the QR code here to get some more information. Then we have module three and four. These both of these uh, modules are more targeted towards social entrepreneurs. Um, in the uh, business creation course, you learn all about product development, go-to-market strategy, impact measuring, pitching, and um, other things. Um, this is a five-day intensive training. Um, and then on the right side, you see the business growth course. And this one is targeted towards social entrepreneurs that are a little... Um, larger already that are looking to scale um, so they already have a proof of concept so here you're more looking at growth strategies um, some high impact business models because yeah maybe those in business models vary a little bit from non-social entrepreneurs um, it also helps you to, to define your kpis um, measuring your impact um, exactly so those two are um, only five days, whereas the other one was a 12-week program. Again, here, you can also find the, the QR codes as well if you want to look at them. And I think, Vanessa, if I'm not mistaken, in yeah. uh, this growth course, there are only four more spots. Is that right? Two. Two. Actually. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you if you like to, if you're interested in it and like to uh, grow your company and to have a Want to scale it? Uh, I think this is a really good idea, and you can apply until uh, I think in the next two weeks. But I would hurry. I would recommend to hurry. Yeah, okay. yeah. I guess if there's two more spots, yeah, you yes. should hurry. But thanks for the clarification. Um, yeah, and then also uh, we're encouraging you to follow us on social media. Then you can see updates such as the one that Vanessa just gave you. Um, and also when the programs are opening, when they're closing. Um, exactly. You will hear more about the um, storytelling events, such as the one that we had today. Um, yeah, so highly recommend to follow us so you can stay up to date. Then um, we have a female founders initiative. Uh, that's a combined initiative between um, Startup Campus and uh, Impact Hub Zurich. Here we have workshops, events, community building. There's a female founders map, um, as well as a 
Pod podcast. And one of the things that's actually coming up um, very soon, that's on October 20th, is the Rise Up Summit. It will take place in Kraftwerk here in Zurich. And it's a full day um, summit where you can learn anything. Uh, yeah, there are going to be different workshops where you learn different skills that are important to, yeah, that you will need as a female founder navigating the space. Um, actually, it's not only for females, it's for everyone. <laughs> um, organized by female, but for everyone. Um, and there's be there's going to be many interesting uh, keynote speeches as well from inspiring um, people in this um, in this field. So highly recommend to join us there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, it would be super nice to hear your feedback about this startup um, story events. Um, it's really cool for us to know what kinds of things you're interested in, any further topics. Um, we have a big network, so we're always happy to find cool speakers that share important insights for you. So feel free to scan this QR code and tell us what kinds of topics that you would like to hear in the future. Um, yeah, and we'll also send you a follow-up email with the recording of this session, as well as the link to this feedback form again, uh, if you can't scan it right now. But um, yes, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Hopefully it was interesting to you and it was, um, yeah, you learned some things in case that you have an exit in mind. Um, I know that I learned many things from the three founders that we had now. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining and I hope to see you in our next event that we're having. Have a good afternoon or evening. <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.